Hello everyone, thanks for joining. We'll get going in just a moment. Hello and thanks for joining. This is Leah Freeberg from Fluke Reliability and you are with us for a best practices webinar. This is our first webinar of 2021, so I want to give an extra thanks for you all being with us today. Thank you. You probably know Fluke as a test tools provider, and you may also know that we produce some of the industry's favorite reliability tools from infrared cameras to vibration meters. But you may not know that many of the measurements that our tools collect now flow automatically into EAM systems of record. It happens via a framework that we call Fluke Excelix. Our goal at Fluke Reliability is to better connect asset management data and teams with asset management systems and to drive connected knowledge. And of course, that knowledge depends greatly on best practices in condition-based maintenance. So that's why this series of webinars explores reliability maintenance strategies, and that's why we feature speakers from a variety of expert backgrounds. Before the presentation, we have a few housekeeping items to go over. Today's session is being recorded, so the phone lines will be muted to minimize background noise and we'll be answering questions both during the presentation and afterward during Q&A. So take a minute now to find the questions tool in the GoToWebinar dashboard. Please feel welcome to submit questions as we go. I will share as many of your questions as time allows for our presenters to answer. And if we have unanswered questions at the end, we'll follow up with written answers. If you'd like to receive the slides from today's presentation, please let us know during the survey that will appear at the end of today's session. So don't hang up until the survey appears and you've answered the questions. We're also happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's webinar. You'll see a question on the survey about getting a certificate. Answer yes and we'll send one to you. A recording of this webinar in full will be available on the Excelix.com website within a day or two. And that's it for housekeeping, now for the main event. Today, we are very pleased to have with us Keith Larson, Editor-in-Chief of Control Magazine, and Ankush Malhotra, President of Fluke Reliability. They will be discussing the rise of the connected worker, implications for maintenance and operations in 2021. Keith has anchored Putman Media's publishing initiatives in the industrial automation space since joining the company in 1989. He currently serves as Editor-in-Chief of Control, as well as Vice President of Content and Group Publisher of the company's automation portfolio, which also includes Control Design and Smart Industry Magazines. He holds a Bachelor of Sciences degree in Chemical Engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and worked as a research engineer for Amico Chemicals before joining Putman. He holds several U.S. international patents, among other journalistic achievements, has been honored with the Jesse H. Neal Award for Editorial Excellence. Thank you so much for joining us today, Keith. It's a real pleasure and honor. Real, really happy to be here. Wonderful. Ankush is president of Fluke Reliability Solutions, a division of the Fluke Corporation. He was recently promoted to president after serving as vice president and general manager. He has a 14-year veteran with Fluke having held a number of executive positions, including strategy, product, commercial, and operations roles. Uh, Ankush is an experienced M&A strategist, having led Fluke's acquisition of eMaint and Fluke Technic. In 2019, he was tapped to lead Fluke Reliability, a business unit focused on delivering IIoT hardware products, software, and services to industrial maintenance and reliability teams worldwide. He holds an MBA from the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. Thank you for joining us today, Ankush. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Keep looking forward to the discussion and uh, welcome everyone. Hope everyone's uh, staying safe and healthy uh, through these difficult times. Indeed. Today we'll be referencing a new report on manufacturing digitalization called State of Initiative. Published in late November 2020 by Smart Industry Magazine, this report has been ongoing for the last six years, creating an excellent prior data set to compare against and assess our current situation. Keith, can you give us some background on this report? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Leah. The, um, I like to call this the the longest longitudinal study um, existing in the era of, in the age of manufacturing digitalization, and I'm sticking to that until somebody tells me otherwise. But it really goes back some six years when really this IoT um, industry 4.0 data analytics was starting to really um, um, catch in, into fashion in the at least in the in the media brains, and we really have done this survey where we go out and really discuss 
how is this whole movement and that digital transformation proceeding? And this is really a breakdown of, so, so that when you see some of the responses, you can tell um, job by job function and by industry uh, um, who's responding to this. And so you can kind of see yourself in this data. It goes very broadly, obviously maintenance and reliability are represented, but it's much broader than that. We kind of think of smart industries being a little bit of a fast company for the industrial uh, set. So that's kind of where we're trying to get all job functions across industrial companies. Uh, maintenance repair and reliability obviously being a huge key, key one there. It's one of the most recent surveys I've seen. And as you say, it's got six years of data behind it. So I'm very, I feel very fortunate that we have this to reference today. So thank you. And I think one of the nice things is we've got the COVID era contrasted with the last five years, which, which helps as well. Right. So what we'd like to do today, actually, audience, is invite you to answer some questions that are similar to what we see in the poll, because we want to keep us a little grounded, if you will. So those of you who've been with us before, you should now see the poll on screen. And if you have your screen maximized, you'll need to reduce it a little bit. But, uh, and you only get to answer one, you only have one answer, one, one option here. So how has the pandemic impacted your digital transformation efforts? Has it fast-tracked your implementation of digital tools and techniques? Has it jump-started your planning? Has it slowed it down? Has there been really no impact or are you not sure? Any of these questions are, any of these answers are completely fine. Again, our goal is to give our presenters a little background on you and your interests, and then also to see how our audience today relates to the national survey that we'll be sharing. I'd like to get about 75% of the audience to respond. And uh, I know that this requires a little bit of thought, so give it another 10 seconds or so, and then we're going to close the poll down and share the results with everyone. And uh, I'll ask our experts to chime in. Okay, we're just about there. I'm going to close it down and share the results. All right, we have 21% of the audience saying that they have been able to fast track their implementation of digital technology. 22% say it has jump started their planning. 24% say it has slowed down their transformation efforts, 19% say no impact, and 14% say not sure. So Keith, I'm gonna start with you since you're the most familiar with the national survey. What do you feel about these answers? Well, I, th I, think, it, I think it makes a lot of sense and I think it gels with, with what we found across a broader um, survey. I think we, we've seen, um, I guess what I would call kind of a bifurcation of, of, of activity. Some of the, um, capital project improvements, things that were on the list to do this year have maybe maybe been put off because of the downturn in, in manufacturing and, and some mm -hmm. slowing. There. But at the same time, there have been the, some of the nice to haves have become gotta haves um, in this era in terms of digitalization. When you look at things like anything that would facilitate social distancing and help uh, anything yeah. from plain vanilla automation all the way up to remote tools um, for um, if you can't get on a plane how can you still get your job done those those kind of investments have gone mm -hmm. whether whether it was justifiable or not it was a, a have to do so yeah, i just did the math and we're actually at a 43 43 split between the two answers that would be on the move forward side and the two that would be on the slow or no impact side which is interesting ankush what do you say about these answers Not sure if Ankush is there. We're going to move on to our next slide at this point. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, uh, not for the first time. We'll be on mute and talking. <laughs> <laughs> but what's interesting is just to compare this to Keith's uh, the work Keith and his team have done. It just mirrors exactly what that is. I think from our perspective and at Fluke Reliability, as we've spent time with customers and partners, some of the things we've seen is there's almost been like a there's been two different kind of uh, time periods. Right at the time of the pandemic, I think everything slowed down because you know people came to grips with how to deal with this, how to take care of our employees, how to take care of you know the essential work that needs to happen. But then I think slowly the pivot happened, where we've seen a lot more emphasis now on fast tracking uh, some of these digital initiatives. So I think I, I'd, I'd like to say that we've seen this as kind of two different worlds. Uh, much more 
on the on the slower side earlier, much more on the faster side now. Partly because I think you know some of the foundational stuff that that organizations need to do to take care of the employees and stuff has happened, and now I think they've been able to make that pivot. Okay. Well, here is what the national survey said, and uh, these two graphs talk to changes again within the last year. The graph on the left shows that more plants overall are accelerating their digitalization and moving from early pilot to actually transforming their operations, whilst the graph on the right depicts how plants are experiencing the various degrees of COVID-19 disruption and a high degree of uncertainty causing some projects to stall. So that compares very interestingly to our poll just now. So you can compare how you answered to the national results. But Keith, I'm gonna ask you again about these two trends in particular that we have on screen here about what they say about the state of digitalization in America. Yeah, I think on, on the left side, I think what's interesting is <clears throat> this really plots it longitudinally since we started the survey or reported the survey back in 2016. Um, the gray part at the bottom, if you can, it's a little bit of an eye test, but it's uh, folks that said they were kind of in the starting gate, just kind of evaluating digital transformation, identifying pilots is that orange sloth in the middle, and then investing in applications, which actually this past year, despite the downturn, um, has really um, increased in terms of percentage um, into, I think, just over half were investing in digital transformation initiatives, even in the face of the pandemic. So this was as of November. Um, identifying pilots, obviously that's a little bit smaller than it was simply because um, there's so many more that have, have moved ahead uh, to, 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 make, uh -huh. to make it. And I think on the right, it really shows that bifurcation that, 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 that the, the poll showed as well. Half, half has seen it, the, the pandemic slow what they're doing, and mm -hmm. half of the accelerator. And I think a lot of that right. depends on what kind of, of, of manufacturing you do in a lot of mm -hmm. cases. So are, are you, were you faced with the need to um, implement measures for better social distancing and getting people out of crowded packaging lines, control rooms, or did you have an already pretty, um, <laughs> pretty remote workforce already or pretty much yeah. uh, socially distanceable um, operation. So I, I think I think it very much gels with what our audience is here today. And I should correct my earlier statement. Neither of these data samples are US centric. Both the report and our audience today are are global in nature. Yeah. So these both these data sets represent a more international perspective. Yeah. Uncle, they, uh, they are they are US centric, probably about 90% US. Um, mm. But there's a significant amount of um, of, of, of uh, respondents that are part of our um, yeah, our database. Mm -hmm. So, Hankush, how does this compare to what you see out there? Yeah, just a little bit of what, what I was talking about earlier. I think we've seen these kind of two different periods of how how companies and organizations were looking at things. But one of the things, and again, I think Keith, you mentioned this as well. I think depending on the industry vertical, I think you see different trends as well. But a lot of the executives we've spoken to, you know, you know, you know, they're you know, they're 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 they're, uh, they're reporting and telling us that they are actually uh, responding to some of these changes even ten times, twenty times faster than before the crisis. So some of this is simple stuff like remote working, right? How ready for organizations to do that and where they are now. But even in, from an operations point of view, migration of assets to the cloud using some advanced technologies. We'll talk about that later today as well uh, in, in operations. I think there's just a higher acceptance and, a, and, a, and, and the need to do some of that because it's, it's, some of it is the necessity. Some of it is they see the clear benefit to the business. Mm -hmm. uh, we do different approaches traditionally. One, you know, customers would pilot something, uh, prove out the ROI, and then scale it. I think the model still exists. I just think there's a higher sense of urgency to get to that ROI and scale stage faster. I think the second thing we're seeing often now is just a very top-down diktat and urgency of, mm. of experimenting and trying things which allow these companies to become more efficient. But also I think the pandemic is forcing them to do that. Uh, so I think I think that that's, that's some of what we're seeing in our business and, and when we talk to our customers more than that. 
Okay. Um, Keith, a short question for you. Are there any other big drivers that we should be considering? Well, I think one of the one of the big ones that that I that I see that's kind of outside the the pandemic situation is just the ongoing um, retirement of of much of the industrial oh. workforce. We see that mm -hmm. as a real struggle for for manufacturing companies to uh, to attract new people to come come work for a, a traditionally a dirty industry, and they'd rather go. Uh, Work for Google or uh, Amazon, maybe a uh, little, little sexier, uh, uh, least stock value certainly. <laughs> than, than some yeah, of the that's going to change. I've yeah. talked with uh, Michael Carroll of uh, Senior VP Innovation for Georgia Pacific, and the, one of the biggest pushes behind their digital transformation efforts was they really looked at their workforce, and 40% of their 35,000 person workforce was 55 or older, and they they really did the did the math and decided. We can't sustain this, even if we wanted to keep our processes the same. We we just can't sustain it. So they had to actually start looking at how do we go from a um, what he says a, a a tribal knowledge based workforce mm -hmm. where they had discontinuity in operations when somebody retired. Um, how do you change your work processes there? Yeah. Most of the internal groups were reactive, kind of operating on beliefs instead of data, and hard science. Um, and, and really, they, they found that they had 50%, he estimates 50% extra workers around in case they were needed, and they were masters at inventing work when they weren't needed. So, I mean, those are these are things that um, clearly, for most organizations, are finding unsustainable uh, moving forward. But that's just one example of a large company that is realizing that you can't just have those just-in-case people around. So you've got to figure out ways to reinvent your work processes to um, be really asset centric versus operator centric. Well, I'm actually going to take that as a segue to our next topic, which is exactly that, the impact on daily work. Our question is, how does it impact the daily life of maintenance and reliability professionals, this digitalization process? And this diagram here is just an example, and it's very asset management focused, where the goal for a lot of teams is to start with asset criticality assessment, informed by failure modes, decide what kind of data you need, and then decide what kind of sensors or cameras or devices you need, right? And uh, then try to sync that, perform analytics for the purposes of condition monitoring and so forth. Um, but uh, the question is still, what does that mean? How does this change my job? Right, and we've called it connected worker in this presentation. So what does that look like? So, Ankush, I'd like to start with you. How do you think the job roles are going to change? Yeah. So, you know, at a high level, you know, we've got new tools, new workflows, uh, you know, continued use of devices, lot more mobile, lot more remote. So, invariably, that's just going to change workflows and and how people do their jobs, right? But let's take the maintenance example, right? Uh, a lot of the maintenance work today happens as route-based maintenance. I don't think that's going away, but there's just a higher use of sensors, online tools, I think, which will allow, allow the maintenance techs to get a pulse of the assets and allow the, them to prioritize their time. I think it would allow, if every, every time I've spoken to a tech, they're so busy firefighting, I think that there'll be a shift where they'll be more proactive and by using some of these technologies that allow them to do less of that firefighting. I think a few other things. I think techs will be guided by their mobile devices. I think where they spend their time, where they need to focus on, uh, how do they take the next step, where, what repairs to do, how do they collaborate, how do they get information sooner? A lot of that will happen through their mobile device if it's already not happening. And you know we've seen a lot of that especially in some of the uh, digital natives who are entering the workforce, they're just more familiar, but also more, more in tune with using some of these devices to help them do their job better. Uh, I think there'll be more leverage of data. Uh, when I think about industrial plants, there's data everywhere, and it's always been like that. I think what's going to change or what's already changing is how the data is coming together, how people are able to pull that data and help them get the insights so they can make good decisions, business decisions around their critical assets. Uh, and, and maybe the last thing I would say, again, building on what Keith said about, you know, there's 
you know, the Georgia Pacific example is a great one where you're seeing a lot of the aging of, of, or a lot of retirement in the workforce. Uh, I think where we see a couple of things here will happen is a lot more use of tools and technology. Augmented reality is a great example. Not being able to travel because of COVID forced organization, forced our teams, our service organizations to see how we're using some of this technology to really support some of the asset uptime by connecting with subject matter experts who are not in the facility. So how do you bring that expertise in the facility without needing to get on a plane? And I think, you know, all of this would allow us to think about our skill sets and, and how we do our job in a much different way. Those are great points. Keith, I want to bring you in here. How close do you think we are to some of what Ankush was saying, actual prescriptive diagnostics that um, don't just highlight problems, but get us to the point of recommending solutions? Well, I think it's it's really a matter of more implementation and adoption than the new technology. I mean, the technology is there. It's a matter of of, of reworking work processes to fit with what's available. And that's many times it's 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 the people not the technology that gets in the way in some cases some of the the mindsets and the way we've always done it uh -huh. um i think prescriptive analytics really entail leveraging the 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 um, more powerful and more connected devices that we have can you think about um uh, just um pr predictive um uh maintenance we're going out and we're it's this bearing is telling me it's it's it's, it's it's wearing out, it's gonna fail. Um, but to get to be prescriptive, we have to know what the impact is. Do I have a new bearing here or do I have to order from the plant? Can I get more life out of this bearing by slowing down production by 20% so that it'll last until next week when the new bearing shows up? All of those things require connectivity out into other sources of data um, that are beyond you know that that narrow um, control and instrumentation, whether from the automation side or from the maintenance side, um, has it makes it requires a more holistic approach. And of course, you can get into machine learning and AI when when you've already um, when when you're getting to the point where hey, this has happened before and this is what we did. But it also takes some additional configuration from the people who who do understand what what the potential courses of action are, and then determine what data from supply chains what data from uh, other aspects of the operation have to be brought in to make that uh -huh. prescriptive decision versus uh -huh. really, uh -huh. hey, this bearing needs help. To make the decision, you have to pull information from other areas. And I think that's, um, it's, it's the technology's there, but it's a matter of implementation. That's actually a really optimistic viewpoint, Keith, that I greatly appreciate that the technology is not what's holding us back anymore. It's the scope of change that we need to make, and that comes into business decisions and everything else. So I, I greatly appreciate that. I'm going to... It's just moving so fast. I mean, there's right. more, than, more than we can digest. <laughs> so audience, I want to encourage you to continue to ask questions. Um, and I'm going to jumpstart that a little bit by asking a second poll of you. Um, I want to know how you and the audience would characterize your company's digital transformation so far. So has it been highly successful, somewhat successful, problematic but ongoing? Has it been a failure or have you not yet attempted it? And again, there are no wrong answers. You only get to select one. I'd love to get um, over half, if not 75% of the audience answering so we get a good quorum. And we will have some uh, national or global answers to similar questions here to share in a moment. So we want to see how your status here compares to the global scene. I'm going to give it about five more seconds. So just make your best choice here. And then I'm going to share the results. All right, closing now and sharing our results. So we have 12% saying highly successful. 45% saying somewhat successful. 30% are continuing to give it a go, problematic but ongoing. 0% report failure, and 13% say they've not yet attempted. Ankush, let's start with you first. What do you think about these answers? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's it's great to see it's great to see the the success rate here, right? Where yeah, where, where 57% some sort of success, 30%. Are, are are not giving up, and I think I think that's really important. So 
I think I think that's 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 uh, that's great, and I think that's that's the right approach. I, a couple of things that come to mind. One, I think where we start and how we start is really important, and I just encourage everyone to think about that. You know, what are the use cases? What are the proof of concepts you're trying to prove? How are you can trying to get to ROI? And I think it really sometimes uh, what what decides between success and and not is is a little bit of what what was what, what was the use case what was picked to to go after i think okay. that's one second i think just don't deter yourself on failure i think see what the learnings you get out of that if there has been and 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 then you know go go give it another try i think it's it's a matter of time that you'll see the benefits of it and keith what would you say about these answers yeah i mean it, it, i think what it what it really illustrates is that hey this digital transformation is is promising, compelling, but it's it's not like it's not like falling off a turnip truck. I mean, there's real work to be done and there are real obstacles to to it. And yeah. getting started fits and starts. Um, mm -hmm. most people in that um, in that uh, somewhat successful but or problematic but ongoing stage of things. But I mean hey that's that, that's how things are. Um, and Chris talked about you know the difficulty of, of, of proof of concepts and then it's getting to scale. I mean, that's probably one of the biggest challenges is, okay, once you've demonstrated that it works over here, how do you, how do you roll that out across a global organization with a 200 manufacturing facilities? I mean, that right. all at different stages of maturity with different established technologies, different installed base of equipment. So it's, it's, it's not automatic. It's easier than it used to be with some of these tools, but it's mm -hmm. not automatic by any means. Well, here are the, the larger survey results for comparison, and uh, I'm going to say that our audience is, is tracking pretty well. They have fewer on the problematic end of things, and I would say slightly more on the somewhat successful, yeah. fewer failures. Keith, what would you say about what we're seeing on screen here? What points would you call our attention yeah. to? Yeah, I, th I think I think the, the difference between the some just a matter of if they're half glass half full people or glass half mm. but it's a similar type of a, of a, a perspective there um so very similar to what what we saw in terms of the poll um mm -hmm. from what we saw across the broader study i think some of the um obstacles on the right are interesting um you know last year economic uncertainty which is number one in terms of a um, key obstacle that they find um, mm -hmm. It was down at eight or nine, I forget exactly, but uh, people were not worrying about um, uh, economic uncertainty like they are this year for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But again, from uh, the perspective of the, the people challenges, the, um, the culture challenges on moving things forward, that's really the, the, the more, the most, um, um, the biggest impediments to, 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 to change lack of business impact understanding, lack of senior management knowledge of what's possible, um, lack of employee knowledge. I mean, these are all uh, these are all things that point more to under vision and understanding mm -hmm. what's possible and, and being able to implement um, than it is around um, the technology short, shortcomings. Yeah. We've certainly had some speakers in this webinar series who would strongly agree with you. Ankush, uh, can you describe the pressures that manufacturing leadership are under right now to implement these changes? Yeah, so I think I think some of this even Keith spoke about. I think there is there is just a higher level of uh, intensity pressure from the mm -hmm. C-suite as well, where this is not an option anymore. It's really yeah. the thing got to get done. I think the question really is where do you focus on? How do you get to that business impact quicker? I think we saw this in some industry verticals, especially those which were in the, you know, in the front line, you know, healthcare, pharmaceutical, food and bev, especially during the COVID crisis, uh, which you know is still there, is really where where downtime was just not an option, and I think it just posed a really important question to some of these organizations, right? What should we do differently? How can we be able to react faster and and ensure some of that uptime? So I think I think in those industries it's very obvious, but I think even outside of that, I think com com companies and organizations where where they were much more well versed with or had a plan have just weathered the storm better. 
And I think that's posing the question on the others, how do they do some of this? Now, on some of these challenges that that I think, uh, you know, Keith and the team have done the survey talk about, I think a few things jump out to me. And again, we hear this often from uh, from 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 our customers who are who who are seeing some of these pressures, you know, there's 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 this you know making the proof of concept work, uh, seeing how you can scale it, uh, and I think my my view is if you do the upfront work and you know pick the right use case, I think ROI is almost never a problem. I think one of the other big things we see is interoperability and data integration, and you know customers are now wanting another data island. Uh, or or creating another silo, and I think that's that's probably one of the things which has been a big struggle, of uh, even when we come in and introduce some solutions or or others, how do they make sure that that fits into whatever exists? Uh, so I think that's 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 something really important that the industry will need to figure out here over the next year or so, uh, how how we're not creating data islands, but how we're you know combining and working together with each other. Right. Keith, I was surprised to see number nine for for cybersecurity or security concerns. I think those concerns are still there, but I think uh, I think you would agree with me that that organizations feel more confident and comfortable that they have a plan to address and they have a knowledge, awareness, and 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 a and a plan to execute there to get comfortable that those risks aren't are, don't come to fruition. Yeah, I'd agree. I think. Um... Well, there's there's fairly robust security solutions even for OT environments now that are available. So I think ranking it low doesn't mean everybody's got their act together. I think I think it's ranked low because people realize there are solutions available. They may not have implemented yet them yet, but sure. um, it's 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 more of a like okay if we go forward, we know how we understand that solutions are available to to do that the security on on the plant floor and in these these environments. Um, getting past the, the realization that technology is there and getting your, your house in order, I think, are two different things. And I think that's why it's, it's ranked low, because they don't see it as a key obstacle as much as a, um, we, if we had the funding, we'd be doing that. We, and we know we have some sense of how to get it done, mm -hmm. whereas some of this other stuff, they, they may not. So Ankush, I liked your, your point about you can't just keep adding technology in a, in a big mismatch, it, it's all got to be integrated. Um, and that can sometimes be a sticking point. So for teams assessing their digitalization goals, where do you suggest they start? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think uh, start small, don't boil the ocean. Uh, you know, you wanna make sure that there is a couple of use cases, proof of concepts that you wanna do, where you wanna get to ROI, create that business impact. Uh, and and then and and they don't need to, you know so I wouldn't I wouldn't ask someone to go do a a major project which allows you to integrate with you know 18 other systems that exist in in the facility I think start small don't boil the ocean prove the concept get the return and I think then it's easier to scale it's easier to get the buy-in it's easier to show the impact and get funding for things to do as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Let's try this one. I'd like us to talk a little bit more about what kind of digitalization teams are actually pursuing right now. What does it look like on the plant floor? And uh, I did ask you both this in advance, and here are some of the examples we have. The biggest ones that you hear about a lot in the field are augmented reality or AR and, and wearables, and uh, sort of the see what I see ability to leverage remote experts. You hear a lot about digital twins, and you hear a lot more about touchless and voice interfaces. But before I ask Ankush and Keith for their opinions, audience, this time, instead of a poll question, I'd love for you to use the questions widget and type in what technologies you are most interested in, either the ones you see being adopted, the ones you've heard about being adopted, the ones you think are most relevant to you. If you'll type those in, then in the meantime, I'm going to start with Keith. You shared an example of an Emerson solution using AR for real-time collaboration. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, that's that's the photo that you see on the left, um, and that's um, a, a tool called Plant Web Optics. But what it is is it's, it's not just a um, augmented reality um, type of interface, so you can share what you're seeing. It's actually tied back into um, their data analytics engine for doing things like pres prescriptive um, maintenance and other analytics. It also has 
geolocation so that if I'm going to send you out to fix flow transmitter FC 101, it'll actually guide you to where SV101 is. So if you think about um, fewer um, techs that have to do more things, um, you've even got um, up ways to, to direct people to find the correct transmitter before you start <laughs> pulling the wrong flow transmitter for, uh, uh, for maintenance uh, before you get mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those kind of tools, but also all of the, that prescriptive um, knowledge that directs people where to go. And then you can also engage with the remote experts. So say you're you're new on maintaining control valves you can dial up and, and engage with a an emerson um, control valve expert back in marshalltown iowa and and get guidance on on on, on what to do with this valve um, or what mm -hmm. the, the signature may mean right so so it's, it's just one example and many of the automation companies are going in this route where um a text can have access to that same information that usually you would need back in the control room or in some file cabinet where the maintenance records are, bringing that out into the field. And similarly, Ankush, I heard the Proof Technic team has been using remote collaboration tools during the pandemic to assist their customers with complex procedures. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty incredible to see some of the innovation and some of the resilience that teams have shown here. Uh, really to take care of customers and get the job done, especially when, you know, the traditional way to do this was our service team would get on a plane, take the equipment, go on customer site, spend days, weeks, and, you know, try and, you know, do the do the service job, which is typically, you know, aligning a, a, a large critical asset like a turbine in a power plant or something like that. Uh, what we've seen is, you know, a, a great example is we have a power plant in the Middle East and we just couldn't get there on site because of various restrictions. So we've been doing this remote balancing uh, and, and, and remote alignment uh, where we're, we're discussing with the customer. The customer obviously have the tools. We ship these tools to the customers in advance, but we're using some, you know, simple technology here where, where uh, augmented reality and really trying to put ourselves in the customer's shoes, understand what they're seeing, and then having a subject matter expert really take the customer through the various steps to really, one, understand the root cause of what's causing the problem and then and then resolve it. I think, I think it's been great to see, one, our ability to do this, but also customer acceptance. I mean, a, a year ago, I think this would be unthinkable. We would like, well, it's so hard to do this, we just, it, you know, customers wouldn't be ready to kind of, you know, jump on, on onto it. I think you see another another uh, picture here on the on the slide here, which is the other example of a digital twin application, uh, which is really we, we partnered with a with an with an organization, uh, a technology company based out of Germany, here, Navis. Uh, you know, they're into spatial intelligence technology, and what we've done is we've integrated our eMaint CMMS with this technology. So for a maintenance tech or a user, it gives them a 360 degree view of their plan from any location, but also gives them a lot of context around the work order. So if you have to go, if your work order is to go to a particular asset and, and take some measurement or do, do a correction, you can actually see the context where this asset is, what are the inputs, output, what else is happening in that environment, so it gives you this opportunity before you get on site to be more prepared, allows you to get an expert involved if you need to. And, and it's really having a digital map of the plant, for, plant floor, which gives them a big leg up and a huge efficiency boost. Very uh, good. Yeah, and maybe one, one other thing that comes to mind here uh, is, is you know, we've we've uh, recently, you know, last year partnered with uh, and made an investment in a technology company called Everactive, and this gives us access to battery-less technology for some of our sensors. And and you know, from a one of the biggest pain points we saw when when we were uh, deploying sensors to collect data to to diagnose critical machines, some of the pain points our customers were saying was, you know, you got to change batteries after a certain period of time. Or you're limiting the data that you're collecting with with some of the work ever active and the team has done i think it's just great technology that gives us this advantage to our customers to really collect that data without having that headache of you know am i am i going to run out of battery or anything like that i think mm -hmm. i think that's just incredible 
Well, I think that uh, the audience is right along with you both. I'm seeing comments about mobile devices. I'm seeing uh, comments about data integration into the, the, the correct alarming right, for more active monitoring. I'm seeing video uh, virtual training clips linked to work orders and interest in two-way video. And um, another comment about finding the, the right technology and working with multiple vendors to bridge, right, just like we were talking about, and more about data analytics and <laughs> working it into PM rounds and that audience is, is very insistent on those things working together. Um, Realware, uh, Chalk App for sharing real-time issues with diagnostics. So excellent. Thank you, audience, for contributing. I'm going to ask one more question and I, I'll start with, with Keith. Um, bringing it back to the what's in it for me sort of perspective, as all this change is happening, what are the benefits to the people on the team who start to use this kind of technology? Well, I, th I think that um, one of the workflow processes that changes is that as you have access to um, more multiple sources of information on the plant floor, mm -hmm. we're gonna, they're going to be pushing decisions uh, much lower in, in the organization, actually, so that you can people who are close to what's really happening can can make informed decisions to keep production running or or optimize production. And it's going to be more responsibility on the people out in the fields and not just got to radio back to the control room who's then going to talk to a supervisor. There's going to be more um, responsibility, but also more informed information with the people who actually out, are out there um, in, 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 in knee deep in the process, put it that way. Right. Ankush, any thoughts you want to add to that as far as the benefits to the to the individual on using new technologies? I, th I think it's such an exciting time if, you know, for me, uh, I, and again, having spent some time speaking with a number of uh, uh, folks in, this, in, the, in the industry, I think it's just an opportunity to reskill and, and get in, you know, and really get the advantage of some of these technologies to really evolve our careers and do things that, you know, which, which earlier we were limited based on just not having access to some of some of the technologies. I think, you know, Keith said the other part really is the efficiency, right? I think it just, uh, you know, where where uh, we, I mean, maintenance techs by nature are so resilient, they can all get, it, you know, medals for being resilient and firefighter. <laughs> I think yeah. uh, but probably that's not what we wake up every day wanting to do. And I think uh, the advantage of using some of this allows us to really change this from being more to getting to be more proactive. So I think there's just, and those are just some, a couple of things, I'm sure there are many others, uh, but that come to mind. That's great. Well, I've got one more topic planned for you and audience keep entering your questions uh, because I'm gonna continue to sprinkle them in here. But um, uh, we've stayed pretty grounded up until now in this conversation, but uh, my sense is that manufacturing um, at an industry level is going to be taking some big leaps forward in the coming years. So I want to know what you see happening on the leading edge of that. Keith, you shared this diagram from Yokogawa. What can you tell us about it? Yeah, this is actually just, just really looking at the move from what I would say industrial automation to industrial autonomy, which is mm. a word that, that especially in the process industries is starting to be used. Um, one of the examples that I that I think of is is uh, uh, companies like um, uh, Liquid Air and others that that, that have basically on-site manufacturing facilities on their customers that are totally unmanned, and they have to build in um, mm -hmm. resilient operations because if their air separation facility goes down, their customer goes down as well. Mm -hmm. So moving more autonomy into um, those plants and more resilience into the, that operation. And some of that has to do with the, 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 the maintenance and reliability aspect as well. Using more drones for inspection tasks. Um, again, uh, we'll talk about maintenance rounds still being there, but you know, there, there may be a, a, a role <laughs> for more autonomous robots to, to, to play in that area. And one example is there's an organization called Sprint Robotics that is actually a consortium of large refining oil and gas petrochemical companies that are looking at 
how do we help drive the, the next level functionality of robots and drones and things like that so that it's not just for inspections, but perhaps doing limited interventions as well um, in terms of, uh, of, of, of maintaining processes. I mean, I, I always think of the, you know, the scene from Star Wars where R2-D2 reaches out of the thing and, you know, fixes the, the, the valve while they're flying along. I mean, that's, that's not out of the realm of possibility for where you want to send a drone to do, you know, in a very dangerous and dirty condition to do what would normally have a required person. So we've got to have the people who can um, um, operate and, and, and deploy these kind of technologies as well. So that's, that's where we're headed. And uh, we'll see, we'll see. Not quite 21, probably a little longer than that. But incremental for sure. Ankush, what would you like to share at this point? Yeah, well, for, for sure, 2020 will accelerate a lot of this, right? Keep yeah. the vision you look, lay out here is obviously really exciting. And and I think 2020, uh, you know, for all its perils, still will accelerate some of this. I think, uh, as we've discussed, uh, you know, the, the job for uh, maintenance, reliability, is really to keep the whole plant up and running, right? So the more digitalized the plant, I think the jobs and, and what they do, is, as we spoke about again here, will change, but I think in a good way. I think uh, I think we see an opportunity for everyone to get more trained here, but I think as they, as they move from being more reactive to proactive, I think there's just a change in terms of the mindset, in terms of how they go about, you know, picking up some of that training and, and, and deploying it. Um, what, what else? Um, you know, facilities are, are, are making their technology adoption decisions, as we spoke about again on business cases, right? There's no longer adopt IoT for the sake of IoT. I think uh, fundamentally everyone's trying to improve their workflow, their processes, their, you know, improve quality of product, reduce downtime, you know, efficiency, all of that. So I think uh, I think we'll we'll see that continue to happen as as long as we see the business impact. And I don't see, I think that'll only be more, not less. Um, um, you know, the, the other piece maybe that jumps out is, you know, we again, we touched upon this, the more integrated and seamless we can make the flow of data and asset health information between systems, uh, you know, or into the CMMS and out onto the mobile devices. I think the more nimble the organization will get, the more confident. So this isn't like, you know, picking any of these technologies about robotics or drones that you, but this is just about making sure the data is available, making sure it's seamless, making sure it is integrated. And I think that itself uh, will go a long way. And, I, and we see a lot of organizations, you know, working together to make this a reality, right? I think I often say, you often need a village to, to get some of these maintenance practices up and running. And I think uh, even at Fluke Reliability, we believe, you know, partnering with organizations and bringing the data or sharing the data will allow us to really create customer impact and make uh, and, and help our customers in their journey as they get to be more digitalized and more automated. Very good. Um, I'm, I'm hearing some questions from the audience coming in and they are still concerned about cybersecurity the more that we digitalize the plant, right? So Keith, can I bring that back around to you um, about do we need to have that on par with us as we are bringing in new technology? Do we need to have a cybersecurity plan right there with it? Oh yeah, I, uh, my response to that earlier justification, I guess, of cybersecurity mm -hmm. is stumbling block doesn't mean that it's 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 dispensable. It's it's got to be there in, in in every case. I think. In general, this industrial IoT, all of this stuff is non-starter unless you have the, the cybersecurity platform to to um, uh, to secure it. Um, there, there's no doubt that that's um, that's a it's non-starter. If you want that remote connectivity, if you want to integrate these different business systems um, and be able to access operational data through um, commercial networks through your smartphone, things like that. You've got to have that cybersecurity all the way from the, the sensor level on, on up into the systems. Right, you really do. Um, I'm very curious though, Keith, you sit at a news desk and you must get all kinds of really 
really sparkly, awesome examples. Um, do you have any other ones you want to share with us? Some, some sort of up and coming, uh, what the future might look like? Oh gosh, um, I was thinking of that last slide that we looked at with the, uh, you know, the the augmented reality mm -hmm. and the wearables, and I got a one up one on a new contact lens based display, so for a heads up display, so you're actually being able to see. Um, and at least displays really? in your contact okay. lens versus now contact a lot lens. of process environments don't allow contact lenses because of the chemicals and stuff. So that right. would be a problem there. But the fact right. that we're even commercializing those technologies as as a heads up display that you can, you know, use walking down the down the street and nobody knows you have it. That's very uh, I don't know, very, very science fiction to me, but uh, very cool. That is it is both of those things. It is both those things, very science fiction and very cool. All right, so audience, we have a few more minutes left and I've gotten some questions in. I've been trying to seed them in as we went and you have time yet to ask some more questions. So use your questions tool. And if we don't get to all of them, have no fear, we will write you back afterward. So this is your moment, Answer your, ask your questions now. I'm gonna keep whittling through my list um, for Keith and Ankush here. So first, here's your, your first question and this harkens back to some of the things we were talking about earlier. Um, obviously, we're not out of the woods yet. So, do you think that the need for continued social distancing will it hold back digital transformation? Will it change the priority of what's implemented first? What do you think? I'm going to start with you, Keith. Um, I think some of that bifurcation that we saw in the data earlier, in terms of things that were kind of nice to haves before are now must haves if they facilitate social distancing. That's that's definitely part of it. There's there's also in addition to more remote or more sophisticated remote monitoring stuff, there's also just fundamental automation that's being done now to um, let's say um, to allow people who work in a meatpacking uh, facility to not be so close together or or things that have not been automated in the past because it was deemed more um, efficient, cost effective to have, you know, 12 people in hairnets, you know, sorting um, candy bars coming off the lines. Some of that basic, well, I think it's basic, it's stuff, nothing new, we know how to do it. Doing those sorts of automation tasks are being pushed forward. Um, but I also think that on positive note, the global manufacturing industry um, is, is optimistic right now. Uh, I looked at the, the uh, purchaser man, purchasers manager index um, here just in uh, December. And it's at a three year high in terms of the outlook, in terms of what, no what how optimistic they are about what's going forward and optimis, optimism measures are at a five year high. So I think people are looking at um, what's happening in manufacturing, what's also um, on Maybe the next side, uh, the other side of the pandemic, when people start buying manufactured goods again and not not just saving and staying home, I think mm -hmm. people are optimistic that that we will turn that turn that corner at some point in in, in 2020. Very interesting. Uh, I have another question that just came in. That's fairly specific about drone technology, and the point is here that uh, from this questioner is that drones still require a human to operate them, right? So if you look at how you might be using aerial inspection right now with a helicopter and a thermal camera, and you've got one, one person plus your pilot doing a full inspection, and the mapping process for how many drones do you need and how many operators do you need to do that same work and drones are awfully expensive right now. So how do we see this boiling down? Are the, is the technology going to get um, drone technology in particular? Do you have any insights, Keith, or, or sort of uh, a higher level on, on how this is going to advance? Well, I, I guess I would just point to um, self-driving cars um, that are coming along pretty well and we trust them to you know, hey, hands off, you know, read a book, whatever. I mean, we're getting there. We're not there yet uh, in general. Um, granted, that's a much larger market of many more millions of automobiles than there are inspection drones for industrial facilities. But some of that same technology right. that will come out of that arena, mm -hmm. is, I mean, it's, it's, it's inevitable that that will be um, coming into the industrial market as well. So the mm -hmm. things that the ability of a drone to recognize and take action that's going to get embedded in those technologies eventually. And if you look at, you know, 
what's there in a self-driving car, take action when somebody enters a crosswalk or crosses the street, hit the brake, those kind of things, uh, they're not out of the realm of imagination, put it that way, it's not that far. I mean, it's hard, but it's imagination. <laughs> yeah. Uncle, say anything you want to add there? Yeah, I, I I would just say, I mean, I think uh, 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 Keith is right. I think uh, there is, and I think you see this in, in the industrial space. You see this in some of the technologies. Thermal imaging is a great example. Uh, you know, uh, the, the democratization will happen. It may take time. I think mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, you know, sensor technology is another great example where, you know, the cost and the applicability and, you know, sensor strength and, you know, the things it could do a few years ago versus now that's evolving so i i i i i tend to agree with keith here that i think it's a question of time when you know some of these technologies will be more prevalent where there'll be more democratization and i think there are organizations which are constantly innovating to to get get to that part to increase adoption right to help mm -hmm. increase adoption. very good yeah i like i like the point about the critical mass and how that that rolls over to manufacturing. I've got one more question I want to ask of you. Well, they're still coming in. So audience, good job. Keep keep putting your questions in there. I'll see how many I can squeak in. Uh, we haven't talked about the importance of partnerships in all of this, partnerships of all kinds in achieving digital transformation. Are they, are they more important than ever? So Ankush, let's start with you. Absolutely, absolutely. As I said, I think we need a village here uh, to get things done on the maintenance and the operations floor. Uh, I think more organizations are participating, you know, uh, we're a great example at Fluke and Fluke Reliability, how and who we're partnering with either horizontally or ver vertically in ecosystems, really with one purpose, we want to create value for the customer. We want to make sure we make it easier for the customer, right? Uh, our investment in Everactive is a great example for batteryless technology. Uh, our investment, our, our, our partnership with Navis is a great example. At the end of the day, what we want to avoid is where customers are now dealing with multiple panes of glass or multiple panes of data to collect the information and do what they need to do. And I think this is where we can we can all help in the industry by by making it easier for our customers, but I think creating greater value by having these alliances which allow customers to have a more robust solution and, and get more acceptance. Indeed. Keith, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would I would totally concur with that, Coach, because uh, I mean you think about the industrial IoT type of value proposition, your the whole premise is integrating different sources of data from different um, domain experts on the supplier side to mm -hmm. work together to accomplish a particular task. So just by very definition, I mean the industrial IoT industry 4.0, whatever you want to call it, is is it's such a it's always an ecosystem solution. I would go as far as to say that any 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 solution that positions itself as, as a you know, siloed single vendor solution is, is really a non-starter because that just just won't fly back right. to the drone analogy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to sneak in one last question. This is a short answer, and it's we it's not quite the elephant. We've already talked about this, but get down to to jobs in maintenance, reliability, manufacturing operations. Net net, are we going to have new jobs being created? Are some jobs going to become obsolete? What do you think is coming? Keith, do you want to start? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think the jobs are disappearing, but I do think that the, the jobs are changing. There's no doubt about it. I think just talked about the new tools and Fair technologies. Um, I think there's a new generation of, of professionals that will be able to more effectively maintain and, and keep equipment running, be less reactive, less firefighting, and more you know, care and nurturing of, of processes as manufacturing facilities. So mm -hmm. those maintenance folks will be more, more equipped to make decisions. Um, they'll be assisted by package intelligence and, and mobile, mobile devices so that they can take action based on um, the recorded um, intelligence of, of other subject matter experts. And they'll be working more closely um, with remote experts. So people with really deep domain expertise around um, how packaging works or how other things work, they're not going to be getting on planes all the time. They're going to be, they're going to be, they're going to be stationary and they'll be able to spread their expertise over many more yeah. facilities and fleets of, of equipment. So 
a particular OEM, a compressor manufacturer or a pump manufacturer is going to have that expertise that they can lend to their end user fleets. And there, there may be internal experts that are used in large companies as well. Right. But right. we're going to see more and more of that domain expertise being spread across. Evolution. The so these guys, okay. will get to home, these guys will get to home at night. Uh, yeah. Instead of, uh, <laughs> Any last thoughts on that? No, no, I think Keith summed it up. I think my only ad would be that I think the jobs are 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 fundamentally there. I think the, what's changing is going to be some of the new, newer skill sets that would be required to only get more efficient, to get home, mm -hmm. uh, to get more more proactive uh, and things like that, as opposed to, you know, fundamentally a big shift. Yep. Well, I'm going to sneak in a few more things here before we close. I want everyone to note our upcoming presenter, Sonia Mathura from Strategic Reliability Solutions. She's a noted lubrication uh, analysis expert. And if you haven't yet caught one of her training sessions or read her book, I strongly suggest attending this webinar on January 20th. You'll find more information on the excelx.com website. And then, as I noted earlier, please stay online for a moment after I close the webinar. There'll be a brief pause and then the survey link will appear. We would greatly appreciate if you could take a few minutes to complete the survey because your feedback helps us keep this content relevant and helpful. And everyone who completes the survey gets a copy of the presentation. And if you'd like to receive a certificate of attendance, make sure to answer yes to the certificate question on the survey. And uh, this, the recording of this conversation will be available in full on excelx.com within a day or two. And with that, we're going to close things out. So thank you very much to everyone who attended our first webinar of 2021. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Keith and Ankush. It was such a pleasure having you on the show today. My pleasure. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, Keith. Take care. Pleasure. Thanks, Ankush, Leah. Bye now. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon, everyone, and see you next time. Bye. Thank you.